My name is Michael Carter. Most of you probably know that. Um, I want to thank the crowd again. This is our biggest. We count at least 110. So who would have guessed? A few years, we started with six people and then eight and then 20 and then amazing. So uh, thanks for everybody for, for showing up here today. And thanks to the class of 64. I get a lot of the BHS class of 64. I get a lot of support, we do, from my old high school classmates. And some of the other years, too, like 63, 65. <laughs> so, uh, to begin with, uh, Randy Richardson wants to make a brief uh, announcement. You can just do it right there. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I wanted to let everybody know that Vince Ross, who is a postal historian and knows a lot about Monroe County and Owen County postal history, will be speaking at the uh, Owen County Public Library at 6 p.m. on Monday, December the 18th. Um, and this is sponsored by the Sweet Owen Genealogy Club. This is a free program. Everyone is welcome, and I'm going to pass around a little notice. I don't have enough for everybody. Obviously, I didn't plan on 110 people, but uh, take one if you are interested. Thanks. Thanks, Randy. And again, can everyone hear back there in the far reaches? All right. Uh, my minister of propaganda, everybody knows, is George Carpenter. And he's going to utter a few words here. Maybe. <laughs> wow. Thank you all for coming. Uh, as kudos are coming out, it's uh, basically the Legion, Post 18, has always been our host. And we're always glad to be here. We thank them for their cordiality. Uh, the meals are good. Please be generous with our servers. Always my friends at CATS. They make your YouTube uh, presentations possible. Uh, how many of you do not get my emails? Okay, if you would like to get emails about the, the, the uh, presentations that are upcoming, please give me your email address at the end of the day, and I'll add you to our distribution list, which right now is something in excess of 140 people. So we have quite a following. Mike always mentions his wife and his mother when he comes. Well, now it's my turn. I'd like you to meet my wife, Mary Ann. On December 9th, we'll be married 50 years. <laughs> Mary deserves all the credit and all the sympathy. Thank you so much for coming. Mike, have I covered everything? Uh, yeah, that's good. Sit down. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I mentioned this last time. We we have a, uh, a, a list. We have people booked through uh, August of next year, which is kind of amazing. So, real quickly, I'll just name them off. Uh, now, our next meeting is going to be a little bit different time. We hate to change it, but. The regular time would have been uh, <coughs> December 26th, the day after Christmas, and that just didn't seem like a good idea, so we're going to move it to January 2nd, the day after New Year's, and I think we'll have people there for that. Uh, Derek Ritchie, who's given several programs here, will go over a lot of the photos that we scanned from the Herald Times, Herald Telephone, uh, a few years ago, and uh, that's always interesting. People help us identify uh, all the photos that are on there. Uh, January 30th, Rex Waters, who's uh, on the DNR, will uh, do a history of Monroe Lake. And he did that for us once before, about three years ago, and there were about 20 people here. So I told him, do it again. Uh, Christine Friesa will be here February 27th. She's from the Monroe County Public Library. And she's going to talk about the bicentennial and the, uh, the timeline that she's uh, involved with. Currently, March 27th, Dan Combs will come again, and he's going to talk about something of interest to me and George and a few other guys that are in the medical profession, uh, the uh, 1918 flu pandemic, which went through Monroe County like a train 
like most of the rest of the world. Uh, 75 million people died worldwide and quite a few people in Monroe County for, for the time. So that's an interesting one. April 24th, Gib Apple, another guy that's given a presentation several years ago, will do the history of RCA. So I think people will uh, enjoy that one too. Uh, May 29th, Clay Stuckey, who's given probably five or six programs uh, back there. Uh, we're going to step outside of Monroe County just a little bit, and he's going to do the history of the West Baden Hotel, which I think people would be interested in. With just t touching on the French Lake Hotel a little bit, because he doesn't know as much about it. But, uh, <laughs> but the, West <laughs> the West Baden he knows more than anyone about. Uh, June 26, Bob Hamill will be back, and uh, he's going to talk about the Monroe, uh, Monroe County Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, and then July 31st, Brad Cook uh, from IU Photo Archives uh, will do the uh, history of IU Part 3. He's given two parts so far, and this will start around 1930, where he left off last time. August 28th, uh, David Nord. We'll, we'll step outside the county a little bit again. He'll give a history of the Spring Mill State Park. Clay and I went down there a month or two ago to watch his program to see what it was like, and it's a, it's a very good one, too. Now, today we have uh, Jeremy Boshears. Uh, Jeremy's a friend of Phil Childers, who's an old friend of mine, and Phil's kind of the one that got me uh, looking at what Jeremy does. At, last year. He introduced me to Jeremy and uh, Jeremy showed me the work that he had compiled thus far on the covered bridges of Monroe County. And it took me about a nanosecond to realize that he really should do that for this group here. Because, uh, you know, not only covered bridges, which are interesting in themselves, but the fact that these bridges are from our own county, what, what could be more uh, suited to our local history than this? These 13 bridges uh, we featured in his upcoming book, The Covered Bridges of Monroe County, which will be out in 2019, I think. Uh, so uh, I look forward to this because uh, I know very little about covered bridges, and today I, I stand to learn a lot, I figure. So, Jeremy? to thank everybody for coming out today. Um, my presentation today is going to be to cover bridges of Monroe County. Before I start, I need to give some thanks to Phil for introducing me to the History Club and also my wife Carrie who's helped me a lot throughout this project and my three sons Jeremiah, stand up boys, Jeremiah, Mason, and Charles. Uh, a lot of the artifacts that are laying on the table, they go out with me when we're searching for those. They call it bridge hunting. We take the metal detector and you never know what you'll find. So, This project I started in 2009. This isn't something I really would have been interested in. I, I like antiques, uh, into the local railroading history, family history, stuff like that. A friend of mine brought me a picture of a covered bridge and it said, covered bridge near Unionville. And I, there's an old black and white photo and I thought somebody must have been lost. There weren't any any covered bridges in Monroe County, which I was born in 1976, so the last one was gone before I was even born, and I really never heard too many people talk about them. Now that I've been doing this, I've stirred up a lot of conversations and hear a lot more stories about the bridges. So my friend John Fry gave me the picture. I started looking into it. I found out what used to be down the Lake Lemon Bottom with the church and the bridge and everything down there. The more I searched, the more photos I found. I see a lot of faces here in the crowd that have given me stories and photos, and it's things like this, the Peden Farm Festival for Children. I go to that every year and meet people. A few of the items on the table were given to me by people that were there, and just conversations. Anybody who has stories or any photos or anything, I'd love to speak with you afterwards. And after my presentation is over here on the screen, we'll turn the lights back on. I do have some artifacts and maps and different things up here on the table. I'd welcome everybody to come up and look. And there's a model here we built of what was the McMillan Bridge. So we'll get started here. Uh, like I said, I started this in 2009 with my first photo. Um, I guess before I get into that, everybody's been asking me the covered bridge that they're going to build here in Monroe County. 
Uh, Jim Barker from VS Engineering is working on that project. I talked to Jim just the other day. He said it is a live project now. They do have a contractor, a local firm called CLR. He said they closed the bids just the other day. So it is a live project now. It's the Cedar Ford Bridge from Shelby County, which was dismantled several years ago and has been in storage. The complete bridge uh, doesn't have enough material to build it, so they are going to have to get some material to do it. But they've been doing the surveying, and I know they've been purchasing ground down there. So it is a live project. I don't have an expected date, but we are further along. He said one of the big issues with building a covered bridge is there's all kinds of special permits you have to get uh, for the weight rating, the width. It doesn't have guardrails, all kinds of different variances they have to go through for the state. So he said they've been working through all that, but it is a live project now. And hopefully here in a couple of years, we'll have a covered bridge where the McMillan or what most people would call the uh, Williams Bridge nowadays uh, once stood. So Monroe County was formed in 1818 and named after President James Monroe. Many of the roads around the county were still being made. You've heard of blazing a trail. Well, blazing a trail was cutting a path through the woods and the briars and burning everything off. That's blazing a trail. Road names on, the, say, the 1895 map I have down here, road names could be after a person or a family or the town you were destined for. On some of the old maps in Monroe County, it would say the Martinsville Road, but if you were a county north, it would say the Bloomington Road. So a lot of the roads were named roughly for where the destination was, and it may be a road that was several counties away. Besides poor road conditions, creeks and rivers had to be crossed. Uh, early roads were dirt, or they used uh, creeks for traveling, and several roads here in the county are named after the creeks that were used that we used to drive in. Road conditions were poor most of the year, best during the summer during the dry season. Uh, here's a photo of what you might see on a normal unpaved road back in the day, uh, muddy and rutted for several months out of the year, especially in the wintertime, rainy seasons. Uh, here's a road where they're using the creek, as many of the roads in our county used to be. There were three major creeks in Monroe County, Bean Blossom Creek to the north, Salt Creek to the southeast, Clear Creek to south central, and one river, which was the White River, on the northwest corner of the county near Gosport. Here's a map of the county that I've made. As you can see up here at the top, the blue line running across, that's Bean Blossom Creek. Up at the top left near Gosport is where the right White River would be. At the lower right down here where Lake Monroe is, this is the Salt Creek Bottoms. And down through the center here is Harrodsburg, that's Clear Creek. And that's a current map of Monroe County. This is an 1895 map. I know it's kind of hard to see, but I have it down here on the table and anyone that would like to look at it afterwards, I, I'd invite you to look at it. And there's a lot of interesting details and things about the county on that map. Uh, methods of crossing a creek or a river. You could either, you've heard of fording a creek or fording a river. You're driving through the water. Uh, ferry, you could take a raft or a boat to travel across. And uh, types of bridges you might use would be a piling bridge a covered bridge or a suspension bridge. So a ford, uh, this gentleman here with his team of horses and wagon, they're getting ready to ford the creek, they're going to cross through the water. Problem with that, during the rainy seasons and floods, you couldn't get across. So you might go on down the creek and find a ferry. And Monroe County amazingly had several ferries. Uh, I've searched the Monroe County Commissioner's record starting in 1818, and it's amazing how many ferries are listed in different records. I wish I'd have kept track of how many I came across. So here's a ferry. They're bringing a car across the river. Like I said, there were several of these in the county at one time, and where many of the covered bridges were located, uh, there were ferries also at those in, before the bridges were built. So uh, bridges of a piling type. Pilings are driven into the ground or into the creek bed. The entire structure is subjected to weather. There wasn't any treated lumber or anything back when these were built. Uh, five to ten years was a normal lifespan due to the rotting of the wood. They were prone to wash out during flooding, but they were cheaper to build than a covered bridge. 
So here's a piling type bridge, and there's a bulldozer in the creek. Uh, they might be pulling out a log jam or something. I'm not for sure what all is going on here, but you can see how the pilings are in the creek and in the water. During flooding, debris would build up against those, and a lot of times it would build up enough till there was enough pressure, it would actually wash the bridge out. Like I said, the flooring of the bridges would become rotten also over time. A covered bridge. They were a self-supporting structure. They didn't have any supports under the bridge. They only sat on the abutments. The roofing and the siding protected the bridge from weather to prevent it from rotting. I've heard a lot of people say that they put it on there to make it look like a barn so horses would go through. That was not the case. Um, as long as the bridges kept their roofing and their siding on them, they would last for a long, long time. Once the siding would start to fall off, um, if you come up and look at the model or look at these pictures, where all the diagonal timbers meet, um, at the top of the bridge is called an upper cord, at the bottom is a lower cord. Where all those timbers would meet, that's where they would start to rot out, and once that part becomes weak, then the bridge wouldn't hold anymore. So they kept the siding and the roofing on there to pr protect all that. They were built on stone abutments above flood level so that they wouldn't wash away. Uh, a few of the photos you'll see that the water is right up to the bridges, but they always made sure they got them up high enough and they set on stone. A lot of your other bridges would just be on a, some type of a wooden abutment, which would also rot out like the bridge. There was a higher cost to build these than the piling type, and the internal structure was pre-manufactured on some of the bridges. So here's a covered bridge that was down in the Lake Monroe bottom. This is the Goodman Bridge that was down by the dam. As you can see, it's got the roof, had wooden shingles, wooden siding, and the stone abutments you can see on the far side. And if anybody um, throughout this, uh, I'll go through each bridge, and if anybody has any questions, um, when I get to the end, I'll ask for if you have any comments or anything, I'll stop after each bridge. Monroe County had 13 covered bridges using four different types of truss design. The Burr Arch Truss, Howe Truss, the Smith Truss, and the Smith Low Truss. So the Burr Arch Truss. Uh, several people have probably driven through bridges and recognized the big arch as you pass through. So the Burr Arch was designed by Theodore Burr in uh, 1804. He added the arch to the bridge right here that passes along here to a king post style truss. Now the king post style truss would actually hold the bridge. The arch didn't have to be there, but adding the arch added a considerable amount of strength to the bridge. So that would be a Burr Arch bridge. A how truss. The how design, and there's a piece down here on the table you can look at. It's a big casting. The, the X pattern on here was made of wood. The smaller vertical lines are iron rods, and at the top cord and the bottom cord, there were large castings that those timbers rested against and gave it the strength. And those bolts had to stay tight to keep the bridge in good working order. The Smith truss. This is a Smith truss here. It was designed by Robert Smith. He received his first bridge patent in 1867. And he also pre-manufactured his trusses for his bridge in Toledo, Ohio. His bridge, uh, all the structure you see here would be pine. And I actually have a piece of one of the timbers from one of the bridges down there, um, from what, the McMillan Bridge. His bridge had the upper and lower cords, but if you notice, there's some areas that extend through the upper and lower cord Everything was notched and passed through there and bolted. The ones that extend through are under tension. They're actually being pulled. If a car were to come onto this bridge and stop in the middle, there, and there wasn't any of the upper structure, the bottom cord here would bow down in the middle and collapse. What happens when this is all put together, as this is starting to pull down, these timbers that are passing all the way through the upper cord are pulling on the top and being under tension. That results in the compression force. This upper one here is all being compressed to the middle, and the other diagonals, such as right here, let's see, they don't go all the way through. This one right here, those are under compression. So part of the timbers are being pulled, and part of them are being compressed, and all together, it makes for a strong bridge design. And uh, one thing you always notice on a Smith truss, there's a timber right here on the end that's slightly angled and notched in. If you go onto a bridge and you notice that, you'll notice that that's a Smith truss. Some of them will have iron rods in them that they've added at a later date to help when they get weak. So we'll start with the bridges. 
the church bridge. It was built in 1876 and taken out in 1952. It was in service for 76 years. It was 102 feet long, had a five ton load limit, used a Smith truss, and was built by the Smith Bridge Company. It was removed when they built Lake Lemon. Here's a photo of it. Um, in the Lake Lemon area, at Riddle Point Park, there's some islands out there. Some people know them as Cemetery Island. There was a church, and then this bridge stood out there by that. This is the church bridge. This is looking north. Here's a photo, and if you look, you can see that this is actually the back of the Bridge Church of Christ. So the Church of Christ was named after the bridge, and the bridge was named after the church. You had the church bridge and the bridge church. The, uh, like I said, the bridge was taken out. This is standing on one of the islands. This is what was known as Cemetery Island, and the graves were all moved. The bridge was torn down, and the church was moved. So when they were getting ready to build the lake, all the property was being bought, and Dale McClung told me that the last parcel of ground was the church. The city of Bloomington wanted to pay an amount for the church, which the church didn't feel was enough. They wanted the church moved. So one of the members of the church had some family who was a lawyer, and they asked them to come to one of the meetings when the city was going to be offering them a price or what they were going to do for the church. The city made them an offer, and then the lawyer stood up and said, that's not good enough. Here's what we want. The city officials called the lawyer into a special meeting in the back room and offered him some money to be quiet and leave, and he wouldn't. <laughs> so the next day, he went to the courthouse and filed some paperwork, and the progress on Lake Lemon was kind of going to come to a halt, but amazingly, the city of Bloomington was more than happy to move the church. So the church, they uh, actually, I've got some photos, I don't have them in this presentation, they actually uh, raised the church up, put it on rollers, and took it up the road. They started out with a wrecker, but it wasn't big enough, and actually had to go on up the road and borrow a bulldozer, which they also had to widen the road, and moved it up the hill, and the Bridge Church of Christ is on Tunnel Road now, and if you go past it, it has a brick front which has been added, but the back part is the original part of the church. It was built in the 1920s, and they said when they moved it, the only damage to the church was a little bit of cracks in the plaster in the corners. But I, I asked him, I said, how many days did it take to get there? And Dale said, about four days. I said, what did they do with the church? He said, oh, we just left it in the road for the middle of the night. <laughs> I said, what did people do? He said, well, they just drove around it. I said, okay. He said, there wasn't much traffic back then. So today, the abutments for this bridge, which are right here and right here, uh, I talked to some fishermen that go down there, and you can still find the abutments with a fish finder. And here's a picture of Dale and Brenda standing on the bridge. And if you look in the background, the, br the bridge is being dismantled at this point. You can see the water, and the lake actually flooded a little bit faster than they had planned on. And Diane Young said her father said he was the last one to drive across that bridge before everything was completely flooded. But they did get the bridge dismantled, and the abutments are still out there underwater. Here's a map. I'm going to show a map of uh, the county every time we talk about a bridge, because I know some people aren't familiar with certain parts of the county. So up here at the top right, this is Lake Lemon. And this is a map that I made of Lake Lemon. The black dotted lines uh, are from 1895 maps. So right in here is where the railroad trestle crosses the lake. Shuffle Creek comes down. This is Tunnel Road. And if you go down to the lake at Riddle Point, the boat ramp is actually the old road going into the lake. It crossed here. There's the church and the cemetery and the bridge are all located right there. Does anybody have any questions about the church bridge? All right, we'll move on. GPS coordinates for that bridge? Yes, uh, the book that I'm writing, I, I, you, I do. Uh, the book that I'm writing, I have driving directions starting out at the Monroe County Courthouse uh, with driving directions to get there and GPS locations uh, for anyone who wants to find them. And the, IU Press is going to publish my book. It'll be out in the spring of 2019. And I've talked to the History Club, and if you're on the mailing email list, they'll send out a, a message whenever you can pre-register for copies. So the Cutright Bridge was built in 1880 and lasted until 1963, 83 years of service. It was 144 feet long. It used a Howe truss, but it was built by the Smith Bridge Company. They would build bridges of other types if that's what you requested. 
It was partially dismantled and lost a fire caused by a cutting torch during the disassembly of 1963. As they were building the causeway that we drive across now, that bridge was over to the left as you're going south. They were dismantling the bridge and it actually caught on fire. I actually have one of the castings down here on the table. Like I said, after this is over, uh, don't get up and leave. We'll, we'll turn the lights back on. And there's some artifacts out here on the table I'll talk just a little bit about. Like I said, everyone's more than welcome to come and look at everything afterwards. Here's the cut right bridge. Uh, one interesting thing about this bridge, right here on the middle of the portal, and each bridge kind of had some unique features you would, you would notice that the craftsman had done. Right in the very center of this bridge, there's a little bitty V-notch cut in both ends. That's what I've noticed in a lot of the pictures. And there was always a Pepsi sign on all the photos I find. <laughs> this is an aerial view looking of where the bridge was at. To the right of the bridge would be where the causeway is now. And at the upper right corner of the road that goes back to the cut right launching ramp would be back there. Now the creek is moved. Um, where you cross the bridge on the causeway, they moved the creek bed a little bit. So here's a map of Monroe County. Lake Monroe is down here on the lower right, and the cut right is down here where 446 crosses the lake at the lower right. This is a little bit better zoomed in map that I made. Uh, the dotted lines are what was there before the lake was put in. And if you notice, the red line coming down the middle is 446. The creek crossed more out here in the middle. Today, the, the water passes under right here. The bridge was right here. If you drive down there and go just a little ways in, you can actually still see part of this old road right here. But this was the Cutright Bridge, and um, the Cutright family lived down there in that area. I've also seen it listed as Cartwright in a few references, but the Cutright is what you'll find it under in most of the commissioner's records and historical information. Does anybody have any questions or anything about the Cutright Bridge? All right, we'll go to the Dolan Bridge. The Dolan Bridge was built in 1878 and lasted till 1927, 49 years of service. It was 100 feet long, had a how truss, and was built by the Western Bridge Company. It was replaced by an iron bridge in 1927. So here's some interesting features about this bridge. Uh, at the top of the portal, it, it had a special design on it also. This is looking north, and today, Old 37 is right here. They moved the road over when they, brought, when they improved the roads. So today, we're standing in about the same location. The covered bridge would be over here to the right, and here's the road. There's a house right up here in these trees that you'll see in some of the old photos of this bridge. It's still there. And here is the iron bridge that they built. This green iron bridge, there's probably several people here in the crowd that remember this bridge that used to be there before it was replaced. And the bridge is still in use. There's a car has just passed through it. This is around 1927 when they replaced it. And here's a photo again looking today at the new bridge that's there after the iron bridge was replaced. So Dolan, Indiana is up here, kind of the north central part. I don't have a road drawn on there. That would be the old Highway 37 that goes out through this area. And here's a little bit different map of Dolan that I made. The dotted line shows where the old, the old road has changed its location in a few places. Um, there's a few references in the Monroe County Commissioners that they call this Gray's Mill, and I'm not for sure if there was some type of a mill there at one time. I haven't found any more information on that, but a few of the historical records listed as Gray's Mill or the Dolan Bridge, depending on what area you're looking at. Is it, yes, sir. Regarding that bridge at Dolan, uh -huh. is that the same site, uh, the location where uh, in the early 1950s a bus wreck killed a bunch of people? Okay. The bus wreck was further south. Further south. As you come down the hill, the big steep hill, the first creek you cross right there is where the bus crash was at. I think it was 1948. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions about that bridge? All right, the Fairfax Bridge. Fairfax Bridge was built in 1879, was taken out in 1963. They used it for 84 years. It was 125 feet long, had a how truss. It was also built by the Smith Bridge Company. 
It was destroyed by arson November 7th, 1963. It was scheduled to be removed for Lake Monroe. There was a preservation group that was trying to get the bridge moved, but I found a few reports that someone came down on the evening of November the 7th and said that the bridge was burning at both ends. So someone had set it on fire. Some local people think that it may have been intentionally set so that it didn't slow down the progress of getting Lake Monroe built. But I don't have any proof of either way on that. So here's the Fairfax Bridge. Uh, behind the bridge, you'll be looking up towards Fairfax. As you came out, the road went to the left and the right. Here's an aerial view. Like I said, Fairfax would be at the upper right corner. You would come out. You could turn right and go to Chapel Hill or, or I mean, excuse me, turn left and go to Chapel Hill or turn right and head over towards Harrodsburg. This was an important part, especially after the railroad was in, there was the railroad depot south of Smithville down by Depot Hill Road. This road connected across through Harrodsburg and connected Chapel Hill and all this area together down in here. Here's a map of the county. Fairfax is down here at the center, lower right, just beyond where the Fairfax uh, State Recreation Area is. And here's another map I've made. This is of the lake. The black dotted lines are the roads that would show up either on the 1895 map or pre-1960s. And like I said, the bridge set right here. The road went to the left, also crossed over here by the dam, crossed the Goodman Bridge, or you could turn right and go over in here to Chapel Hill. So it connected all those areas down there and connected people with the railroad. Does anybody have any questions about the Fairfax Bridge? Okay, the Goodman Bridge. The Goodman Bridge was built in 1881, lasted till 1964. It was used for 83 years. It was 100 feet long, had a how truss, and was built by Thomas A. Hardman and was removed in 1964 for Lake Monroe. And here's the photo I had earlier. Uh, to the right over in here would be the dam at Lake Monroe. There's a steep hill just to the right of where the, behind the photographer where they were standing. That's the steep hill, but actually the road that you would drive on now when you go down to the dam and cross is up right behind the photographer there. What happened to the bridge after it was removed? Um, Part of these down here were just pushed in the creek and burned. But the, the Goodman Bridge in later years was getting in really bad shape. This was one of them that a lot of the siding had fell off of, and in later years it had signs that just said, cross at your own risk. So it was getting in pretty bad shape. But um, I think that was one of them also that was just pushed off the abutments and they burned them. Here's an aerial view of the bridge. And like I said, to the upper right is where the dam is today. and down here at the lower right is the steep or big tall hill that you'll actually would drive when you go down to the dam. The Goodman Bridge was located down here in the lower central part, right down here close to the dam, right against that hillside. And it's right here at number five at the lower left, just above the dam. If you cross over the dam and go onto this launching ramp and look across, you can kind of see part of an old road that used to come down the hill right there. Does anybody have any questions about the Goodman Bridge? All right, we'll move on to the Gosport Bridge. The Gosport Bridge was the longest bridge we had in the county. It was built in 1870 and lasted until 1945. They used it for 75 years. It was 504 feet long, but it was a triple span bridge. It had a Smith truss. It was built by the Smith Bridge Company. They closed it in 1949 uh, due to weak timbers in the south span. After the bridge was built, it was kind of always an argument of whether Owen County or Monroe County was the one who had to maintain it because the people in Monroe County said, well, Owen County people want to come here, and the people in Owen County said, well, the Monroe County people want to come here. So it was always a big argument over who should maintain it and take care of the bridge. It was interesting. It did have electric lights in that bridge, and I found those in some of the old commissioner's records where they paid the electric bill, and I found photos that show the light bulbs hanging in the bridge. 
the south span collapsed in 1955, and then the center span was destroyed by arson in October of 55, and the uh, fireman, Bert Didimore, was killed when the bridge collapsed. So here's the bridge. It, you can see that it has three spans. There's an iron span on this side, and this is Gosport side, and the Monon Railroad is crossing here at the lower part of the photo. There's one pier in the river. There's the center section. There's another pier right here. And then there's the last section, which sits on the abutment there on the Monroe County side. The original bridge had three wooden spans, and I had found that in some of the records, but I never could find a photo. All I could find was people say that, yeah, it used to be wooden, but nobody knew about the third wooden span. So there were two covered spans, and one span was open. The open span was replaced with the Whipple iron truss around 1885, which is what we just saw in the last photo. So the wooden span, uh, local legend says it was destroyed by uh, fire or cinders from a passing locomotive. I don't know if it was that. Uh, the way the tr I'll show you here in the next photo. This is the only photo I have, and if you look at the lower left, this is a wooden open truss bridge right here. And it says uh, Smith Bridge Company, Toledo, Ohio on the sign. But one thing very common about this, like I said on the other bridges that didn't have siding, they were prone to rot because there was no protection. And uh, I've talked to some bridge builders and they said that's probably, it got rotten, maybe. But I don't have any definite records. I just have uh, one newspaper clipping. This says the bridge is closed right now between Monroe County and Owen County. And people have, this was in the winter, have had to cross the river on the ice with their sleighs. So that's about the only thing we can find as to when it was possibly replaced. And I've had some people from the Monon Society help me look at this photo and try to identify it by the age of this switch stand right in here. Uh, here's a picture of the flood. And if you, what looks like is uh, the ground over here is actually just debris that's floating. This is all uh, pretty tall abutment over here it's way up in the air and as you can tell the railroad tracks were crossing right here the 1913 flood yes like I said this bridge actually also had anchors that came from the abutment and bolted up into the bridge the abutments also had a notch put into them to help hold the bridge in case of the sideways force uh, from flowing water but they usually like I said tried to build them above what normal flood stage would be Here's a picture today from standing in Gosport looking at the abutments. This uh, one here in the river is starting to deteriorate pretty bad, this pier. Here's the other pier, and then the abutment is back here on the hill behind. And like I said, these had some iron rods that actually went up to the bridge to help keep it anchored down. On the upstream side of those, the abutments are kind of pointed, and that would help break up ice flow as it came down the river. Uh, here's the bridge after the last section was burned. If you look in the background, there's the other abutment back here. That span had collapsed already. And this photo here was taken just a few days, or maybe the day after the fire that killed Burt Denimore when the bridge collapsed. The arsonists went to jail on that one. Yes, they did. Yes. <clears throat> so here's the map of the county. Gosport is up here at the top left where the White River is. And here's kind of another map I made. The railroads all pass right here by the bridge. This is Moon Road up here in the top center. This kind of dotted section right in here. The road is pretty well abandoned out there. Some of the farmers use it to get to their fields, but it gets to be some pretty rough country getting back in there to it. And uh, me and my sons went back there and took some photos from both sides of it. Does anybody have any questions about the Gosport Bridge? The Harrodsburg Bridge was built in 1874 and lasted till 1949. They used it for 75 years. It was 82 feet long, had a Smith truss, was built by the Smith Bridge Company. Uh, the bridge became weak in the 1940s. It was one of the bridges that the lot, most of the photos, the siding on the bridge is missing for several years, and that's part of the reason it became weak. 
A lot of the local residents tried to get the bridge repaired. The county was kind of reluctant to repair it or do anything with it. Uh, in September of 19, yeah, September 1949, the lower cords on the bridge were cut by some local people, and they let the bridge fall in the creek. And I've actually spoke with some of those people, and they said they were worried because the school buses crossed that bridge every day, and they were worried it was going to collapse with a busload of children, and the buses were kind of forced to go that route. So as much as they hated to, they cut the lower cords and let the bridge fall in the creek. And after that, then the county replaced it. So here's one photo of the bridge that I have. Um, there's some siding down here in the lower section. All of the upper section is missing. Um, that's the only photo I've ever found that, that when the bridge had siding on it. There, if you look right here in the very center, it's kind of hard to see. There's a house right there, and, and that house is actually still there today. Most of the photos I find look like this. The bridge doesn't have any siding on it. And as I've said before, rainwater would fall, would hit these timbers and run down. Right here, all of these lower cords are laminated, and all the boards that pass through would become rotten in those sections. And once they became rotten right there, then the bridge would get weak and fall down eventually. If you look in the center of the photo up here, also you can see the bridge. Um, What's well, old 37 now? There's the bridge uh, that's there today, and that house that I was talking about is still right up here in the center of the photo. That's the concrete bridge that was replaced in the same location. I've looked in the creek down there, and some of the local people say parts of that bridge are actually still down there in the creek. They're kind of under the water and under the stone, but you can still find pieces of it on downstream now. And uh, there's part of my bridge hunting crew there on the left. <laughs> Here's the map of the county. Harrodsburg is down here in the center. Like I said, this is Clear Creek coming down through here. Harrodsburg. Um, here's a little map I made. This is actually Gore Road right here. Now there's a black dotted line right here that I didn't get my arrow placed properly. Um, some of the old maps show that the road went straight across. That'd be a pretty steep hill to climb right there, but they may have back in the day. But the road arcs around and crosses right here. That's where the covered bridge was at. Old 37 to the right, and then the new lane, or new four lane 37 is right here. And this was one of the main roads that came out of Harrodsburg back in the day when that bridge was being used before either of the highways were there. Does anyone have any questions about the Harrodsburg Bridge? The Johnson Bridge. Johnson Bridge was built in 1881, lasted until 1964, had 93 years of service, was 100 feet long, had a five ton load limit. Um, part of the other ones I didn't put a load limit on because I did not know what they were, but some of them I've actually seen the signs in the photos, so I put that down. I mean, it's amazing to think you can put 10,000 pounds out in the middle of a wooden structure that's 100 feet long. It used a how truss was built by Thomas A. Hardman. It was damaged by arson, but was repaired, and that was a few years before it was replaced. And some of my photos I found, you can see where some of the damage had happened. It was replaced in the summer of 1964. There's the Johnson Bridge. Uh, some people in later years called it the Bell Bridge also. Some of these bridges had different names throughout the years. Um, this is looking from the other end, and there's actually a John Deere J&M sign right here on this end of the bridge, and I think that was Jacobs and Mitchell. I think. I know the first part was Jacobs, but uh, that was the local John Deere dealer. This would have been the current bridge, but actually it's been replaced also, too. Um, this is below. This is Kinzer Pike. If you follow the road down to the bottom, that will take you to Bottom Road. If you follow it and wind up around the hill, Naylor Trucking is up here on the hill, and now the road sweeps around and actually goes over the top of 37, which is soon to be I-69. But this was the bridge that uh, replaced the covered bridge. And that was put in in 19... Yes, the new, yes that bridge is done. The new one's done. Um, this was put in in 1964, and it was replaced, as I think around the time that they were doing the, four, the bypass on 37. I, 
found some records that say had some of these projects went in about the same time as the highway was being put in. So here at the top central of the map, the Johnson Bridge is right here. If you're going north out of Bloomington and you go down a big hill as you're going out, as you get to the bottom and cross the creek, if you look to your left, that's Kinzer Pike over there on your left, and that's where that covered bridge was located. Does anybody have any questions about the Johnson Bridge? The Judah Bridge was built in 1884, lasted till 1947, it was used for 63 years, it was 120 feet long, had a burr arch truss. It was built by the Kennedy brothers. The road was semi-abandoned and the bridge was deteriorating, so the county sold it for $500 in 1946, and it was dismantled in the winter of 1946 through the spring of 47. Here's a picture of the bridge. Um, this is kind of a remote area, northeast of the Cutright area. It would seem kind of odd there was a bridge out there until I got to doing some more research, and the Judah brothers actually had a grist mill very close to the creek, and I think one of them actually practiced medicine, so there was kind of a need for that road out there. And that was the Judah Bridge. It has nothing to do with the Judah area, but was named after the Judah brothers mill because that was pretty much the only thing out there. Some books will call it the Lost Bridge because some of the Timber Bridge committees were out searching one day and actually ran across it by accident, so they considered it lost because no one had ever kept good records of it. And this uh, here, you can see uh, in this photo, there's the arch I was talking about earlier. You'll notice on the Burr Arch Truss, a lot of the Kennedy bridges will say Kennedy, they'll have Kennedy, be it Kennedy Brothers, or the, the name changed around just a little bit, but usually it said Kennedy. The date on this bridge is off. It's a year later, and I don't know if they didn't get around to finishing the siding or something on it, but I do know that I have records from the Monroe County Commissioners as the correct date of when it was built, but that date on the bridge is a year later. And another thing you'll notice, like I said, all of these bridges have different features. This one here, the portal has an arch, has a small piece, looks like a keystone here, and the trim here on the ends. Uh, all the bridges have different features about them. And we'll go back down here to the lower right at Lake Monroe. Like I said, here's 446, comes down and crosses the lake in the cut right launching area. If you're there at the launching ramp and look to the right, you'll notice there's a small strip of land that sticks out to the right. Just beyond that, on the north side, is where the bridge was at. There was a road that came down the top of that ridge and crossed down there. Here's a map that I made. Like I said, up here at the top right, number one, is the Judah Bridge. You can kind of see a dotted line where the road ran down through here and crossed. And here's a better zoomed in view. Like I said, top right, here's the Judah Bridge. The road came down, turned, and crossed. Uh, this little inset right here is where I believe that the uh, Judah Brothers had their grist mill. And I talked to one person and he said actually when the lake is low, you can actually walk over there and stand on that abutment. It, um, it's under the water, it's still there. Does anyone have any questions about the Judah Bridge? One thing, it's a Kennedy Bridge. Yes. And if anybody has traveled to see covered bridges, Kennedy Bridges are noted for their gingerbread on the portal. And that's interesting in that it does not have Yes, that's one thing. Of all, of all the photos I have of it, it doesn't ever show that on that one. That's, that's what I, I've talked to some other people, yes. Does anyone else have any questions about it? Uh, the McMillan Bridge. This is probably the one that, um, if anybody remembers, this is one of our last bridges we had. It was built in 1871 and lasted to 1976. It was in service for 105 years. It was 115 feet long. It used a Smith truss. It was built by the Smith Bridge Company. In later years, it was also known as the Williams Bridge. So. The McMillan name has changed several times throughout the years. In the Monroe County Commissioner's records, Jacob Milliken had a sawmill in this area, and there was a Ford known as Milliken's Ford. They petitioned for building a bridge, as they did with most of them. I find that in the records. They were going to build an iron bridge, but were decided to go with the wooden covered bridge. A few years later, Milliken is spelled 
Milligan with a G instead of a K. And then a few years later, it's spelled as McMillan. It changes throughout the years of the commissioner's records. And in later years, everyone knew it as the Williams Bridge because the Williams family had their farm and lived right there next to it. The bridge was restored in 1970. They were actually going to move the bridge, possibly. There was going to be an um, area below Lake Griffey, kind of a historic area. They were going to put some cabins and barns and different things uh, there. They didn't do it after all. With, they didn't go forward with any of it. They decided to go ahead and restore the bridge in its location. But the bridge was destroyed by ours in June the 29th, 1976. And that was our only covered bridge that we had left in our county. So here's a photo of it. Um, there's a, I found a few artifacts from that bridge that I actually have over here on the table. Um, there's, a, there's a rod hanging under here. There's a large turnbuckle, which I have over there on the table that we found, and a piece of one of these timbers. These are plans. I went through the Monroe County Commissioner's records, and State Highway Garage gave me permission to go through records, and this is a blueprint from the 1970 restoration. And the model that I built that's sitting on the table, I used it to scale everything to try to build the model as accurately to size as the original bridge. Like I said, this was a Smith truss. So everything you see here was all made of pine. It was all pre-manufactured in Toledo, Ohio. All of this was pre-manufactured. One of the things about the bridge, they do have a slight arch to them. And whenever they were building the bridge, there was a formula, depending on the length of the bridge, the upper cord would have an inch added in so every so many feet. So after it was done and all of the blocking underneath was taken out, the bridge would actually have just a slight arch to help it with strength. If you look at this drawing, and the blueprints for this are also down there on the table, there's some vertical rods right here, those tension rods. Those weren't original in the bridge. Those were added at a later date. They show up in a few of the later photos. And there's a picture of it after the 1970 restoration. And these are photos after it was burned. You can still see some of the red paint on some of the boards and stuff lying there. Uh, some of the artifacts I've got on the table, me and my sons went down there and we found actually a few of the bolts that bolted the timbers together. Uh, still laying in the creek that were made in 1871. We brought them home and cleaned them up and the nuts actually came loose on them. They're made out of wrought iron, and uh, the wrought iron has a higher carbon content than the regular bolts like you would find, say, at a hardware store today, and the, they rust uh, differently. Be sure to come up and take a look at everything. You'll notice it almost has a wood grain pattern on the places where the bolts are rusted, and that's due to the high carbon content in the iron, but that's after the fire there. This is uh, one of the abut This would be the south abutment. It's still pretty well together. The north abutment has, looks like it's been pushed out with a bulldozer. The stones are all scattered, and a lot of the ground leading up to it is all relocated in different places. But we found a few of those pieces there, and I actually found one of the timbers from the bridge uh, laying there on the abutment under a piece of the sheet metal from the roof that it, went, it all fell down. It protected it all these years. So the McMillan Bridge was up here kind of the north part of the county. Uh, Maple Grove Road in Ellettsville, there's the Maple Grove Crossroads. There's a Maple Grove Road that goes north. If you follow that road all the way down into the bottoms, eventually it'll make a hard turn to the left and go up a hill where it turns into Delap Road. If you stop at that turn and look straight ahead in the trees, it's kind of hard to see because it's pretty overgrown. You'll see where the old road used to go out into the trees a few hundred yards out. And I asked the property owner if we could have permission. We went down there and looked and found some of the artifacts from the bridge. Yes, there's the other, the other end comes out, correct, on Bottom Road, just down from Williams. Uh, it's back in there a little ways, but you can drive all the way up to the other, to the north abutment on the other side. Does anybody have any questions about the McMillan Bridge? Yes, sir. Not being an engineer, I'm not sure, but what, what's the purpose of the two trusses on the end that just tilt in a few degrees? I'm not for sure on that exactly. It was something that Smith incorporated into his design. I've talked to some bridge engineers about it. It all has to do with the compression and tension forces on the bridge. And I'm, I'm not a bridge engineer. I'm actually a machinist. 
Um, so I, I can't explain that one properly. But you, you it, know, fuck up. You're an engineer. No, You're an engineer. You're an engineer. You're a Purdue engineer. I don't know exactly, but things that are square are not very strong. Things that are at an angle are strong. Yes. And it, the bridge, the way they're designed, also another thing I've talked to some of the engineers, not all of the timbers would actually have to be there when you drive across it, but there start to be opposing forces as you're on one end, opposing forces on the other end of the bridge that need to counteract. And like he said, a square is not as strong. Yes, sir. I think with uh, pieces on either end, they're talking about probably transmitted some of the compressive forces on the top cord down to the bottom. Of this, uh, yes, yeah, that is correct, because they were right on the very end of the bridge. And actually on the Smith Bridge, at the very ends of it, there were a casting that those rested on, so all that force was placed right down onto the lower cord on the abutment. That was one of the things about the Smith Bridge. He didn't use very much iron, mainly the bolts, to put it together, but he did have a casting at each corner on there to transmit the force down. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, the Mount Tabor Bridge. Um, I'm not sure when it was built. This is the, probably one of the hardest to find information about. Um, I don't know when it was built. I do know in 1876 it was replaced. Maybe 50 years of service, we really don't know for sure. The length was unknown also, but it was replaced by a 120 foot long iron bridge in 1876. Um, searching through the commissioner's records um, in 1828, found where there's a plat map that actually shows the first records of a bridge. And also in 1871, uh, commissioner's records show lists of repairs of roofing and siding. So that tells me that it was covered. There were some bridges in history that were a piling type bridge and roofing and siding was added just to help protect the structure. But I really can't find much more information. Like I said, it was replaced by an iron bridge in 1876 and I don't have any photos of that bridge. This is looking down Tabor Hill it's, it's pretty hard to see. I think this was back in the 1920s. Right in here, you follow the road around and it abruptly turns up. This is right here. There's an iron bridge. It's really hard to see, but you can find it. And uh, Mount Tabor is a pretty interesting town. To look at it today, there's nothing there. But back in the day, it was actually probably at one time going to be bigger than Bloomington. And one of the advantages it had is Bean Blossom Creek right here. And you're not very far from the White River. Um, they used to butcher, uh, I forget how many thousand hogs per year there in a season. There was a barrel maker. Um, there was all kinds of businesses in this town. They had the waterway. In the spring, they would have flat boats already made. They would load stuff, and some of it went all the way down uh, to the Mississippi and down in there. The one thing that made this die out when the railroad came to Bloomington, that gave a big advantage to Bloomington, and people quit using the waterway right there. And after that, the town of uh, Mount Tabor slowly started to die away. I actually found an old newspaper article for Bloomington talking about make sure we keep our town a good town and don't lose it and don't let what happened to Mount Tabor happen to Bloomington. And it actually talks a little bit about, about the history of what was in Mount Tabor. But like I said, I don't know who built the bridge or anything. There was a sawmill. There's records of that about the time that the bridge was put in. But um, other than that, I, I couldn't find anything in the commissioner's records other than what I just had on the previous tile. This is the bridge that's there today. Um, on a closer inspection that we found, uh, here kind of to the center right, there's abutment stones there, and there's concrete here. I've talked to some of the bridge builders, and they said you didn't start seeing concrete abutments until sometime in the 1920s on a lot of these bridges. So I don't know if these stones right here were from the iron bridge that was there, or if those were possibly from the original covered bridge. I, I don't have any way to know for sure. And Mount Tabor is located up here in the upper left-hand corner of the county. And you can see it's not very far from the White River here at Gosport. Like I said, when it flooded in the spring, they would send the flatboats out. Um, here's another map that I drew a little bit closer. Down here at the lower right is the Mount Tabor Bridge. This is Tabor Hill. Bottom road and everything all meet right here and cross Bean Blossom. And the creek's a little bit crooked, but you can follow it all the way over here to the White River. Does anybody have any questions about Mount Tabor? The 
the Muddy Fork Bridge. Muddy Fork was built in 1873, lasted till 1890. They used it for 17 years, but the length on it was somewhere between 36 and 40 feet. I have a little bit of trouble finding the exact length by the way the commissioner's records are written. And uh, one thing you'll find, uh, the listing of a bridge and its length. When you were buying a bridge, if you bought a bridge that was 100 feet long, the bridge would be 100 feet. There was an overhang put onto the ends of some of them. Uh, like the model I have here on the table, it doesn't really have an overhang, just the roof extends out. Because the big problem was you had to protect all of the structure that sat on the abutment from the weather. So some of the bridge photos, as you look through them, will notice it looks like there's walls that are just built out onto the ground, and that was mainly just to protect everything that sat on the abutment from the weather. So that one there, I had a little bit of trouble. I'm finding lengths of 36 to 40 feet kind of in some of the stuff, but I never did find a definite exact answer like I did some of the others. It was built by the Smith Bridge Company and replaced in 1890. And I don't have any photos of it either. Um, this is a low truss. They were cheaper to build, uh, shorter bridges too. What there were were two walls and inside of those was the structure that you see like on the other Smith bridges. Um, some of them had some supports that came out because there was no upper structure to help hold the sides and give them strength there. Um, they put siding on it and they actually had a few short rows of shingles that ran the length across the top to protect them from the weather. But one other issue with this one, the deck of the bridge was not protected from the weather so they would become rotten also. But they were cheaper to build than the covered bridges and like I said, for a short bridge like that, it, it was a money savings. Uh, the iron bridges were starting to be used, and I find records, like I said, with the McMillan Bridge in 1870, there were bids for iron bridges, but the wooden bridges were still cheaper at the time. So many times they went ahead and went with this design. Um, this is Old 37 looking north. Um, Dolan is right down here, the church, uh, Bolting House Road and stuff. So this is the muddy fork of Bean Blossom. As we were speaking about earlier about the bus crash, as you come down Old 37, down the hill, you'll cross a first creek, and that's the site of where the Greyhound bus wreck was. Some people say that there was a covered bridge there. I can't find anything in the commissioner's records, though the, the, this bridge and the one that's um, just to the south where the Greyhound bus crashed, they're very similar in length, but I never could find any records of what was there for sure. I do have records for sure that there was a low truss here, and um, I've talked to some engineers, the water flow that would come down from all up this bottom along Bolting House Road is considerably higher than the water flow that would have come down from the other area. And there was kind of a rule of so much amount of watershed flowing before they would build a bridge or it had to be enough traffic passing through there. So the other one I'm not for sure about. I do know there was the Greyhound bus crash there and I also know that the other bridge collapsed the one that's to the south. I found some records uh, early 1920s that talked about a paving roller that was going down this road and went through the bridge. But um, I'm pretty sure it was the other one after we've done some studying and looking at, like I said, when this one was built and there was an iron bridge that replaced this one. Here's another map of the county. So the Muddy Fork, like I said, I don't have old 37 on this map. It's just to the right of Highway 37. And you'll see there's two forks right there. The upper one to the right is the creek that follows and goes all up Bolting House and up through that bottom. And then there's the lower one down here is where it crosses right there. That's the one where the Greyhound bus crash was. And like I said, there's some books that will list that there were two bridges. In my book, I put that there was one for sure, but I could not be for sure that there was a second one. And as I've said before to a lot of people, there's as much misinformation out there as there is good information, especially on the internet. So if I wasn't for sure about anything, I didn't. I might note it in my book of what other people had written, but I made sure that I had my facts as close as possible. So there's some books that will list two Muddy Forks bridges. Um, we do know there was one for sure of a low trust type, but I did find that in the commissioner's records. And here's a closer map. So up here is where the photo I showed just a second ago. That is the one we're sure it was a low truss. These creeks all flow out of this bottom up into here, around Bolting House. Down here, Little Horse Road out of this area is the smaller one. And this is the hill at the lower left here is the hill you come down on Old 37. And right here is where the Greyhound bus crash was. 
and this is also where the uh, paving roller went through the bridge and that's one thing that might lead us to believe uh, after talking to one of the bridge engineers it may have been a piling type bridge that collapsed we don't know for sure does anyone have any questions about the muddy forks bridge yeah i got a question yes sir the greyhound bus deal yes when was that Yeah, around 1948, I believe. It killed 15 people. It's still the biggest one loss of life in any traffic accident in Indiana. Okay, so there were 15 people killed, and it's one of the biggest losses of life. Every one of four of them burned in the fire. They were all burned. Yeah, run, a bunch of people burned up and died in the fire. Um, from what I've read, the driver said something broke on the steering, but didn't know what happened and uh, hit that bridge right there and crashed. They accused him of falling asleep, but they were never able to prove it. <coughs> okay, yeah, he said they accused the driver of falling asleep, but no one was ever able to prove it. The driver lived? Yes. Yes. So he's going to uh, No, there were, no, there were uh, some people that did make it out alive, but I'm not for sure of the numbers. Does anyone else have any questions? The Nancy Jane Bridge was built in 1884, uh, lasted until 1964, had 80 years of service. It was 160 feet long, had a five ton load limit. It's Burr Arch Trust Design, was built by the Kennedy Brothers. It was uh, removed in 1964 for Lake Monroe. And when they removed it, it was pushed off the abutments with bulldozers and was burned. This bridge here, uh, a few people talked about trying to save it also, but um, they just one time talked. There was one record they were wanting to try to raise it and use it for some type of an area for fishing down there. But uh, I forget what the water depth right there is pretty deep, and nothing ever became of it. So they just or pushed it off the abutments and burned it. Here's the Nancy Jane Bridge. It got its name from Nancy Jane Chambers. <laughs> On the right up here, in the, above this bridge, is a steep hill, and Nancy Jane Chambers was a Civil War widow, and before this bridge was put in, a uh, local legend is people coming and crossing through this area would holler out for Nancy Jane, and she had a boat and would uh, ferry them back and forth across for a small fee. And uh, you know, that's the local legend of uh, people calling for Nancy Jane to come out, or just Nancy Jane, and she would come down the hill and ferry them across. Um, here's a photo looking out of the portal of the bridge. Up here at the top, you can see her house right there. Um, when the lake was put in, that property was purchased, and the house was also uh, bulldozed down and burned. I, I've been told some of the uh, stones that the house used to sit on are actually still there. And here's a photo looking down from her house. The road made a really hard left turn as you came out because this is a steep hill. And if you look, I don't know the exact height of what the bridge was over the creek, but it was up in the air a pretty good ways. Came out and turned left on the other side. Um, here's another photo in later years. This is what a lot of the photos you'll see. A lot of the siding was missing. It made a hard right turn as you came into this side. And I can't help but think that people didn't run into it and knock it down. I don't have proof. Um, if you look up here, I was talking about the upper cord. You can see how it extends out past this last timber. Over here on the left side, how this siding is built out here a little ways. This is what I was talking about, about having an overhang on the bridge. This protected this end of the bridge to help keep it dry. And if you look, you can see right in here where the arches come down and rest on the stones below. So where were the measurements of the length started the measurements were taken right here at the abutment where it stopped yes yeah because you didn't want to pay for any more bridges than you had to and like i said the decorations this one here had some small decorations right here on the end and this one had an arched portal also just like the judah bridge did this one had a five ton load limit also and there's a sign at the top right that says charles taylor for sheriff on this one then you'll know when it was close to a political uh, seasons because these bridges would be littered with uh, political signs and some of you can't hardly see the bridges for all the signs that are stuck on them this photo here is just right before the bridge was taken down um, 
it's in pretty bad shape looking right here. You can actually see on this bridge photo, you see the arch right here as it comes across and ends over here. It looks like it's starting to sag. I don't know if it was that bad or it's the way the photo was taken, but it is missing some siding. Um, if you look here in the foreground, there's a lot of bulldozer tracks and stuff's cleared off. And I'm, from what I was told, they were pretty sure that this was right before the lake was built when they were clearing it right before they pushed it in. And you can see Nancy Jane Chambers' house up here at the top right. Um, this area right here in the kind of the central part of the lake is an area that you can't drive back to. Um, you have to walk about a mile, mile and a half to get back to it off of this point back here where the bridge used to be. But like I said, these bridges all crossed through this lake bottom. And the Nancy Jane Bridge was number three right up here in the middle of the screen. And the roads from Chapel Hill and all this crossed up through here. Um, does anybody have any questions about the Nancy Jane Bridge? Yep. Yes, sir. If you had to build a high over the water, do they, can you comment about how they did the construction? I'm not for sure. I mean, there weren't cranes per se and all the heavy equipment we have nowadays. I was told on some of the bridges they would actually um, put cribbing and, and a structure below that they would build out onto. And after that was done, they would knock that out and then the bridge would be self-supporting. I don't have any photos and I really don't have a lot of information. That's something I'd like to learn more about. But I was told some of them, like I said, they would build us some type of a structure to start laying the cords out and building it. Um, like I said, the stones also uh, were brought in with uh, teams of horses on some of them. I've read a few of them where the stones for these bridges that were down the lake bottom. Uh, one of the gentlemen had a team that took three horses to move one stone. He had a special wagon that would actually <coughs> drive over the top of the stone and then use some type of a hoist to pick it up and it carried the stone underneath the wagon. Does anyone else have any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, going down the list of bridges, could you mention what body of water, what creek or river each one covered? Okay, we can do that. Um, let me back up here. I'll go back to one of my county maps here and we'll look at that. Okay, um, this here is Salt Creek. We'll start with that one right there. This is the Lake Monroe bottom. Um, at the top right, that's the Judah Bridge at number one right here. Uh, number two right here is Cut Right. It was down by the Cut Right uh, launching State Recreation Area. Number three right here on Salt Creek, that's the Nancy Jane. I think that's Allen's Creek down in that area. As we come on down the lake, number four right here is the Fairfax Bridge. It's also crossing Salt Creek. And right here, number five, is the Goodman Bridge. Let me see if I can get this. My computer died on Tuesday last week, so I had to borrow my son's uh, computer that they use for their school work. It's not quite as powerful, so it's, it might take just a second to back up through some of these photos. Okay, here we go. We'll use this one. So here's our map of the county. Um, the Church Bridge, up here at the top right. This is Lake Lemon now but that was the Bean Blossom Creek Bottom. Um, the church that we were talking about earlier by the church bridge was actually a log church at one time. Um, it was flooded, I think in the flood of 1913, and they said the water got so high it actually washed the Bible off the stand up in the top of the church and messed it up. So when they built the new church, they actually built it up on stones and stuff because that bottom was notorious for flooding when they built that in the 1920s. So, We'll follow Bean Blossom Creek on along the county. It's flowing from east to west. We get over here to Dolan. That was the Dolan Bridge, also called Gray's Mill in some books. Um, that's on Old 37. Just to the south on Old 37, this is uh, listed as the Muddy Fork of Bean Blossom. As we follow the creek on along, we get to the Johnson Bridge, and this is where Kinzer Pike crosses the creek on the west side of Highway 37 as you come down the big hill on 37 there. And there's a new bridge right there which just opened. And like I said, the photo I showed of the current bridge was the one that was there previous to the one we have now. 
as you follow the creek on through the bottom. This is the McMillan Bridge. Uh, further on, we get up to Mount Tabor. Up at the top left is the Gosport Bridge. And that, that's the one that crossed over the White River. Um, we went through here. This was Salt Creek just a second ago we talked about. And then the Harrodsburg Bridge that crossed Clear Creek down there by Harrodsburg. Um, like I said, I'm, I've written a book. Right now the IU Press has it. We're passing it back and forth, working out all the details and all the photos and everything. It's going to be called The Covered Bridges of Monroe County. It will be available spring of 2019. It will have all kinds of photos, maps, historical information. I've got a lot of stories from local residents in there. I have GPS location and driving directions that start at the Monroe County Courthouse. So if you want to go out and find the locations where they used to be, you can. And it's going to be published by the IU Press. And uh, if anyone has uh, covered bridge photos or stories or anything, I would love to be able to see those and get copies of them. I've got a binder sitting up here on the table. Um, it's got duct tape all over it. I've been carrying it around since 2009. It's got about 300 photos from the county, but I'm always looking for more photos. Um, you can call me, email me if you have anything. Um, if we could, turn the lights on, and I'll talk about a few things on the table. And uh, anyone who would uh, like to come up after we're done. Oh, oh yes, ma'am. I'm real curious where you found those old photos that are marked MLD. Those came from some different people um, that collect covered bridge photos from some private collections. Um, the gentleman, Mel Davis, I believe, was the man who took those from, I think he was from around Mitchell, Indiana, I believe. So, uh, like I said, across the tables up here in the front, I welcome everyone to come up and look at everything when we're done here. Um, starting out here, I've got a model that I built of the McMillan Covered Bridge. I used some blueprints, which are actually down here on the far end on this table. And uh, Jeremiah Mason, you guys want to... Um, there's some bolts, and uh, hold those bolts up. Uh, th these bolts right here... Uh, we're in the McMillan Bridge from 1871. We found those in the creek, and the nuts actually came loose on them. Those are made out of wrought iron. There's a piece of a burnt board also laying here. Um, there's a piece of sheet metal roofing. Um, and there's one of the burnt boards the boys found. There's a piece of sheet metal roofing. When we got up on the abutment, we turned it over. They actually found that burnt board. Yeah, there's, a, there's one of the pieces of the roof. Um, there's a timber laying here on the table. It's very delicate. Um, it's a 6 by 12 pine timber. And uh, to measure it from the center out, there's about 150 years of growth rings on that timber. Um, there's at least 20 rings per inch in some locations. Um, a modern timber, if you went to Lowe's or Menards or somewhere, you might get 6 to 8 rings per inch. Um, and I know that timber was considerably larger, but we've got 150 years of growth, and I know that tree was considerably larger than that when they cut it. Um, that tree could have been growing in, when Christopher Columbus set foot on over here. I mean, it's hard to tell. Yes, sir? Do you know the species of the wood? I know it's pine, but I don't know anything other than that. That one was actually underneath a piece of that, or underneath that piece of sheet metal. That's the only reason I still found it. We've been down there several times with metal detectors looking around. The ground is really black, and you can find ashes from that, but that's the only piece of the timber we've found. Um, We've got other pieces. Uh, yeah, there's, this is a large turnbuckle here. These were under the bridge. I said something about it in one of the photos. The turnbuckles were put in later. Um, they went all the way from one end of the bridge to the other. As the bridge got a little bit weak, they added those to help put tension on the lower cord to keep it from sagging as bad. And there's a nut and a big block laying there that was connected on the very ends. And those are buried into the mud. We have got lucky and found those pieces there. Uh, I think there's actually a piece of stone there. We don't have to pick it up from the bridge. Um, some of those stones still have mortar on them. You can actually see some of the chisel marks from where, when they built the bridges. As we move on down the table, there's some, uh, hold one of those uh, castings up right there. Yeah. So this was uh, from the Johnson Bridge. Those castings, if you turn it, uh, turn it sideways, you see there's a hole in how it's angled. Those little pegs that stick down were drilled into the upper cord and there was a crisscross pattern of lateral wind bracing in the top. So there were timbers that came off of each of those angles and made an X pattern that crisscrossed through the upper part of the bridge. And those were mounted in there. There's a couple of rods. 
I found that in the creek a few years back when we had a dry season. I just happened to stop and look to see if there was anything in the creek, and I saw one of those square nuts and a bolt sticking up out of the water, and I knew I'd found something, though I didn't know I'd found a 16-foot long rod. And I pulled and pulled on it and went home and got my father, and I come along in a chain, and we got it pulled up out of the creek bottom. They had lost that one when they dismantled the bridge. So then I had to fold it in half to get it in the back of the truck. <laughs> and, and putting a chain over a guardrail on a county road makes a lot of noise out in the country on a late afternoon when you're trying to find something to hook a come along onto. But uh, those are made out of wrought iron. If you look at those I was talking about earlier, you can kind of see what looks like a wood grain pattern. And that's due to the high carbon content uh, when it rusts. It doesn't, the bolts we have nowadays would just get pitted and falling apart. Those, those hold up different. And that's one thing about the wrought iron. The bolts that I showed you just a second ago, a lot of those will still come loose after all these years of being in the water. You know, like that bolt right there. That Jeremiah found that one in the mud in Bean Blossom Creek. It's been there since 1976 laying there. And uh, just a little bit of cleaning and it came loose. Um, there's some boards leaned up against the table back here also. Um, those are from the Johnson Bridge. Uh, Bob Naylor. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. So a lot of this stuff was pretty rusted, and I cleaned it using molasses. I used a feed grade molasses. I went down to the feed mill and got molasses and mixed it about one gallon of molasses to 10 parts water and put it in there, and it, the acid in the molasses will actually eat at the iron, and it'll dissolve the rust away. So if you've got something that's rusty and you've got some time, uh, you can put it in there. A few of those pieces are almost down to bare metal and shiny. I left them in a tub for several weeks and uh, a little bit of scrubbing with a wire toothbrush and a lot of that came off using molasses. Um, these boards here are from the Johnson Bridge also. Bob Naylor, his father lived next to the bridge and uh, he told me whenever, his, whenever the bridge was taken down that they went over and got those boards when the bridge was dismantled. Uh, the gentleman that lives there today actually gave those to us here. I'm not for sure what the white paint and the curve and everything is, but he said that they came from the bridge. And then, pardon? A lot of Kennedy bridges, particularly the portals, were washed. Yes. Some yes. Um, I think there's also a piece of stone down there. We don't have to move it. That's from uh, the bridge abutment at the Johnson Bridge. I try to find a piece of stone if I can't find anything from the bridges. And uh, that piece, the, most of those stones were too large to handle. But since they were replacing the bridge this summer, they had had some heavy equipment down there moving around. They had broken one of them. So I got a piece of that. It's still got some mortar on it. Um, as we move on down to the next table, the cut right bridge, there's a large arrow-shaped casting down there that's really heavy. We're not going to pick it up, but you can hold up one of the bolts with the big square nuts on The how truss we talked about had the big bolts that ran from the top to the bottom. So there's one of the bolts, and there's some big steel plates. Yes, those were, the plate was put on either the top of the top cord or the bottom, and the bolts passed through. The large arrow-shaped casting that's down there actually set on the cord, and that's what the diagonal timbers came off of at the top and the bottom. So for ev everywhere there was a junction at the top and the bottom, there had been one of those large arrow-shaped castings, and those steel rods would have ran all the way from the top of the bridge to the bottom of the bridge. Yes, sir. Is it possible to come up with a roughly a year at which iron bridges became cheaper to build than covered bridges? The late 1800s, I start to see some of the smaller bridges in the county. 1870s, they were getting bids on the iron bridges. The, some of the smaller bridges in the county were made of iron, but around 1900, um, from there on, I didn't find any records of anything. Yeah, 1880s is about the last I find of any of the covered bridges being built. And then uh, I've got a plate down here. So this is actually not from Monroe County, but a friend of mine gave this to me. This is a bearing plate from one of the Burr Arch bridges that was, that's where the arch actually rested on one of those. This is from another covered bridge. Uh, a friend of mine gave that to me. And um, there's also a stone down there. I don't have anything from the Gosport Bridge, but that piece of stone um, there, that's a piece of one of the stones on the abutment that had cracked and fell off. And if you look at it, you can actually still see the chisel marks along the top of it where they had chiseled it when they laid the stone. That's for the Gosport Bridge. Um, on the table also down there, there's some uh, two blueprints 
from this bridge right here that I made the model of, the Macmillan, or what we later called the Williams Bridge. And then there's a modern, there's a current day map of Monroe County. And then there's an 1895 map of Monroe County. I, I, it's neat to see all the stuff that used to be in the county in 1895. I take a look at that. And um, if anybody's wondering about the lanterns, we started doing this at the Peden Farm Festival. I started this project in 2009. So we started taking a few of the artifacts we'd found and what I had collected. We'd always get over there early every morning before everything was started and it was always dark out and we were out a little ways from the barns. So we always brought our lanterns and set them up. And uh, all the children, even some of the adults enjoyed looking at them. So it's kind of been anywhere we go, we always take the lanterns with us. So that's been something we've done ever since we've started this. Does anyone have any questions? I, yes, sir. How many covered bridges exist now in the state of Indiana? That I'm not for sure. I was talking to somebody earlier. Yes, ma'am. 89. 89? Okay. Like I said, my name is Jeremy Boshears. There's my phone number and there's my email address. If anyone has any photos or know of anyone that has uh, photos, I'd love to see them. And if I could get scans of them or uh, any stories or any information, uh, please contact me. Yes, sir. Did you ever see a railroad covered bridge? Uh, yes, I have. I've seen some on, I think the Monon had some, yes. Um, the Smith Trust design, uh, the gentleman who built this style of bridge actually built railroad bridges and on one of his uh, old photos that show his patent has the low trust bridge, a uh, modern bridge like this, and then the ones for the railroad, uh, they essentially just doubled up on the trusses on his design. Yes. Uh, I know there were how trust bridges also. Yes, sir. I don't know if, uh, if there's one any closer, but somebody who wants to go see a covered bridge, they'll see not a nicer one that's at Williams yes. over the White River west of Bedford. It's been restored in the last 10 years. Yes. Does anyone else have any questions? All right, that concludes everything. I welcome everyone to come up and take a look at everything. And thanks for having me today.